Welcome to The Shooting Show. This week, we're in Romania looking for Mouflon with Paul Childerley. And our optics reviewer, Chris Parkin, reviews a superb value-for-money pair of binoculars from Steiner. We join the action on the second day of a high seat hunt for Mouflon in Romania. This is back in the depths of winter and the hunting ground is not a hospitable place. Temperatures can drop to 15 below zero or worse. Dropped off at my position, I grab my kit from the pickup, but there's no rifle among my gear. I'll be manning the camera on this trip, having sportingly allowed Paul Childerly to get behind the rifle on this occasion, as he's a sheep hunting virgin. As we approach our high seat, we know we're in for a good hunt. There's plentiful sign of fauna, and we've already displaced one flock of mouflon on the way in. It's time to ascend to our lofty perch and see what this late afternoon hunt brings. Once in position, we let the woods settle and anticipate the action to come. OK, Paul, we're in Transylvania for a Romanian mouflon. They're an introduced species, although they've been here for a long, long time. Uh, in mainland Europe. They, they, they came from the island of Corsica. Uh, but it's similar to our fallow deer in, in the UK. We almost accept them now as being British. Uh, they're a wild sheep. Uh, they're quite spooky. Uh, very, very shy indeed. What we've got to do is keep quiet. Uh, it's hard weather. The foresters have been uh, feeding the, the wild boar with the maize. And uh, the mouflon are coming into the maze, so what we've got to do is stay quiet, very, very quiet, and uh, we'll pick out the right ram, a big ram, and hopefully your uh, marksmanship skills are uh, up to the task. Well, we flew with um, Wizz Air, which don't carry firearms, so uh, we used we're using the Forester's uh, weapon out here. This is a uh, Blaza R93. Um, it's a 8x57 caliber, which is good hard hitting round. Um, it's scoped up with a 3x12x50 Havoc um, Swarovski, um, which will do the job. Limited, limited uh, reticle, uh, because obviously a lot of the stuff we're doing is poor light or dark, so we need, we need that. Um, but yeah, I think a good bit of kit. Straight pull, so we can get some rounds off quick if we have to. So yeah, perfect for the job. Well, I've got the uh, Deer Hunter jacket, which is my favourite. Um, great for keeping you warm. And underneath, base layer, uh, merino wool, uh, thermal top, um, keeps the sweat away as well. Um, great, great bit of kit this is. Um, and then the Rusky trousers, which are quilted. Um, all the kit's quiet, so it doesn't make any noise when you're moving around in, in the seat. But, but most of all, these trousers are great because they're quilted, thick, and uh, great for this type of waiting up in these uh, high chairs. Uh, underneath the Ruskies, I've got the uh, Marina wool Long Johns, and uh, all together, it's quiet, it's warm, and as you know, deer hunters go always great value for money. It's not until the late afternoon slides into evening that Paul gets his first real chance. Several mouflon come in to feed. There's a suitable ram among the flock, but picking it out and getting a clear shot is going to be tricky for sure. The mouflon appear settled and unaware of our presence, so Paul is happy to wait it out. Eventually he sees the shot he's been waiting for, a mature ram stood broadside. Drawing a bead through the Schwarzky optic, he awaits the perfect moment to take his shot. Quickly chambering another round, Paul tracks the movement of the running beast before taking a follow-up shot through the dense woodland. 
It's a difficult task, but a blend of experience and reliable rifle scope and ammo setup sees Paul take the decisive shot as a ram passes through a gap between the trees. The 185 grain 8 by 57 Gecko soft point appears to have done its job well, but we can't rest until we retrieve the carcass. There isn't much daylight left and we'll have to act quickly to locate it if we don't want to lose the ram to the wolves. Already the light is fading as Paul sets off towards the location of the shot strike. Here we find a clear blood trail, indicating the animal was hit well at the first shot. The trail persists with the snow proving useful as the paint and pins show up clearly on the white background. After a straightforward track, Paul discovers his ram, dead right where he took the second shot. It's an excellent representative mature mouflon ram and the happy southerner completes the formalities and drags the beast back to where it can be recovered as the night closes in. So Mr Childerley, uh, mouflon in the can, uh, or should I say a mouflon in the bag. Uh, do you want to tell us uh, what actually happened and what went on? Yeah, it was, it was a great, uh, great, great, great hunting actually. We, uh, we asked her if we can go for one of these mouflon and uh, we had to obviously get into the high seat of the high chair where they've been been feeding the area and uh, me and Mr Carr um, stalked our skills in but he's slightly heavier than I am and uh, spooked a big group as we come in which they went off down down through the forest and uh, so we had a long wait in the uh, high stand for a fair while a few little jokes been cracked uh, thinking uh, you know it was all despondent and not going to happen and all of a sudden Pete actually heard them coming in from right up from the far right and they make a lot of noise coming down through the snow um, and that's the reason why we're in the high stand because uh, they're so hard to stalk in this weather because it's so crunchy uh, they hear you coming from miles away and it's just it's just just a hard hard work so anyway they, they come down through and uh, the excitement built and they come down and fed but again they're, they're, you know people say it's just a sheep but you know they're really spooky and, and alert animals that you know they they were there feeding for probably oh, probably two minutes um trying to get so everything adjusted so we can get get a good good clear shot away from the away from the ewes and uh yeah he, he, they spooked he was on his toes went to the back of the the group to go away and um took a shot had to go freehand took a shot freehand um it wasn't a long shot it's probably 50 meters um, took him through the shoulder. He he went off, but actually the first shot I hit him perfect as well. It's just just because they're actually strong animals. It um, he went on and uh, yeah, he was on top of the bank there. Really pleased with it. Great, really exciting, really exciting thing to hunt. Actually, I I didn't think an old sheep, an old tup, would be sort of like something to to get excited about. It never really floated in my boat before, but actually, really, really, really exciting. And uh, yeah, great animal to hunt. I recommend it. It's it's top notch. <laughs> A bit of a drag out, obviously uh, I'd do it on my own, there was no uh, no help given. <laughs> Piss off. <laughs> Childers there successfully adding mouflon to his quarry list. And now it's the Shooting Show News. This is the Shooting Show News. After a hectic week away in Nuremberg for the Ewa Outdoor Classic Exhibition, the British gun trade got together again last Friday to celebrate the best competition shooters from the past year. Organised by Clay Shooting Magazine, the Clay Shooter of the Year Awards took place at West Midlands Shooting Ground, where attendees entered a friendly 100 bird competition, then watched on as the best shots of 2014 were presented with their awards. It was an amazing year, the best year so far by a long mile. You know, we had the Commonwealth Games, which was just the most immense you know experience from beginning to end and all things involved the competition level and then just the experience of the multi-sport event and opening closing ceremonies and then um, yeah pretty steady steady season and then um, the world was such a nice climax because it was the the last big thing of the year and to come home with a gold thing hanging around your neck was just icing on the cake and the beauty of it for me was it was completely unexpected and I think they're the best wins the ones that you, you least expect. Uh, I mean, it's, I've never won one before, so that's that's fantastic. Um, obviously, I had a, a great year last year, which was uh, which was a real highlight of my 
life probably if I was uh, if I'm honest. Having this has, has capped it off. Um, it's been great to be here with Paul Cartridge Company because they've been very supportive over the years. Also great to see three or four pre golf shooters doing exceptionally well who've also been a, a real support for me. Um, I've brought Ed Lyons as a guest who's, who's helped me out a lot with my, my vision issues. Um, and I've got one of my customers here as well, so it's just been a really nice day out. It's nice that I shot decent out there as well. Um, but yeah, just had a fantastic day and thanks very much to Play Shooting for, for putting it all on, really. Catch up with the red carpet gossip in the next edition of Play Shooting Magazine. The general election campaign is drawing nearer and the main parties have been making their views on shooting clear. Basque chairman Alan Jarrett has written to the leaders of each party and had responses from the Conservative Party leader David Cameron and Mike Nesbitt, the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party in Northern Ireland. The current Prime Minister wrote that he is a great supporter of the countryside and country sports. He also said, My constituency is the second most rural in the southeast of England. With the countryside in my blood, you can be assured that I understand and share your interests and concerns. Firearms law reforms are in the spotlight. As an independent body set up to review UK laws, the Law Commission has identified at least 30 provisions that overlap or are inconsistent with others. And terms like antique, lethal and weapon are not properly defined, making the area around licensing these guns confusing. It will hold a three-month consultation this summer and aim to publish a report in the spring of next year. Any changes to the law will then have to be debated and passed in Parliament before they come into effect. A partner at the Clark Wilmot LLP law firm, Stuart Farr, told us it'll take some time to sort out and therefore it'll be business as usual for legitimate holders of firearms who need to go through the renewal process. And there's more firearms news, this time regarding the changes in fees. An order laid before the government last week proposes to increase the fee for a shotgun licence from £50 to £79.50 and the price for a firearm certificate has gone up to £88. The chairman of the all-party parliamentary group for shooting and conservation, Geoffrey Clinton Brown MP, said everyone agreed that after 13 years and at a time of great financial pressure on the police, that a rise in fees was long overdue. And finally, John Rigby's great-great-great-granddaughter has joined the family business. Melissa Rigby will produce enamel work to feature on the company's Rising Bite, London Best and Big Game Rifles. Managing Director Mark Newton believes that Melissa resembles some of her Rigby ancestors and the fact that she is a goldsmith and enameler is amazing. He also said it is clear that Melissa has inherited her ancestors' passion for excellence, attention to detail and perfectionism. That was the Shooting Show News. Hi, I'm Chris Parkin. I'm here today with the shooting show at the Carlton Moor Rangers in uh, South Derbyshire and we've been having a play with the Steiner Ranger binoculars, uh, the Ranger Extreme 8x42. The Ranger 8x42 binoculars are the fairly commonly seen now, what we sort of consider the conventional design of what's called a roof prism binocular, so you get the straight through light path, single bridge, focus wheel at the back, just a, a very good, simple, ergonomic feel to them. The twister pie cups at the back have a larger rubber shade, so when you do twist them up and put them to your face, they shield your eyes from unwanted light, reflections, wind, rain, that kind of thing. The 8x42 specification gives you very good light gathering but also importantly they're compact and easy to handle and store. Neck strap with the neoprene uh, padded for the neck but um, the important fact is you've got things on the new ones like the click lock buckles so one press here brings them out and you can put them in a pocket if you don't want to be using the straps etc and that fits back in. Focus wheel at the back as you would expect. The diopter setting for the difference between your eyes is, is, is here on the left hand left hand tube which sets up for one eye and then of course you've got very fine detailed control of exactly where you're focusing so when you're looking through cover etc you can blot out that cover So many binoculars these days give absolutely fantastic optics and it's so hard to tell them apart even in daylight or, or at the edge of darkness. You might get a few more minutes from summit darkness but what I find really separates one brand from the next is the ergonomics and the focusing wheel and, and how intuitive the use is. 
the click lock here where, you, where your hand sits under your knuckle doesn't interfere with it, doesn't strain you, doesn't you know, rub and give you callus. The weighting on the focus wheel is really nice and the fine focus control is fantastic. There are some padded sections underneath where your thumb, thumbs rest, also great. And, and the rubber armour of course with the deeply recessed lenses at the front. When you're standing up or sitting you can look very easily with your head at 90 degrees to the, to the, the eyepieces. But if you want to lay down or you're prone, very low angle, sometimes you need to get the, the exit pupil closer to your eyesight so you can just fold down the rubber in the eye cups and, and you can just get the angle much more comfortable. One thing I find really irritating with binoculars is when you accidentally you pick them up and one or two of the eye cups has automatically fit itself over and in those half seconds it takes you to flick them back off you might have lost your opportunity to see what you need to see. This doesn't happen with the Rangers which is really good and you can also use the same click lock system and remove them completely. The eye cup design, I do tend to find, pinches the bridge of my nose a little bit. Um, it's not a massive, massive factor. As you'd expect from a premium European optic, they're fully nitrogen charged, waterproof, fog proof, safe against all atmospheric variables, and they don't even fog up inside in fast temperature changes. The ranges retail at £500, which is very competitive for an 842 roof prism binocular. Um, you have a 10 year warranty that, made to Steiner's legendary build quality. Uh, very durable and I'd be really happy to carry these stalking because of course with eight times you've got a great field of view and the light gathering capability of these European lenses is fantastic and I don't think you'll find them wanting at all. Well that's it for this week. Thanks for watching. Please like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And if you're not a member of Basque, it's time to join now. Basque, looking after your sport, looking after you.